Ulaf, who hath his converse with the heavens. They called him a driveler, a stargazer, a maniac poet. His uncle sneered, and the main body of the citizens treated him with that of contemptuous indifference, which must have been harder for him to bear than active persecution. Page 79. Then he tells us that Meccans tried persuasion and treaties, bribes and threats against Prophet Muhammad. Should they array against me and put the sun on my right hand and the moon on my left, said Muhammad? Yet while God should command me, I would not renounce my purpose. Page 80. These are not the words, nor this the course of an impostor, writes Bosworth Smith. Prophet Muhammad was a humble man in every relationship with people and was humble, of course, to God. He was humble even to those who had accepted him to be the prophet of God. Once in Medina, after he had already been told by God that he was the seal of prophets, which means the very best among them, one of his companions developed an argument with someone who held in very high respect an earlier prophet by the name of Jonah. The companion of the holy founder of Islam said that Muhammad was superior, whereas the other said that Jonah was far better. When this was reported to the holy prophet, he said, do not declare my excellence over Jonah, son of Muta, because it is against the dignity of human relationship to go on boasting about your leaders against the leaders of others. The matter of superiority of one over the other is a question to be decided by God, not something to be exalted over. That was the message given to us, unfortunately forgotten by many Muslims of today. A similar incident happened between a Jew and a Muslim over the question of superiority between Muhammad and Moses. The Muslim became extremely annoyed with the haughty attitude of the Jew and even slapped him. This Jew went to the Holy Prophet and complained. The companion responsible for this was very strongly rebuked by the Holy Prophet, who then used the same expression as used in the last incident. Don't declare me to be better than Moses. He went on to relate the excellence of Moses and paid tribute to him by way of comforting the distress caused to the Jew's heart. We hear of the Holy Prophet standing the whole night seeking forgiveness from Allah. His companions noticed that his feet became swollen because of his standing the most part of the night in prayer. They had never seen him committing a sin and believed him to be the most innocent man on earth. They asked him, Sinless as you are, why, O Prophet of God, you seek forgiveness from Allah? He replied, should I not be grateful to my God for all the favors bestowed upon me? At another occasion, when the same question about forgiveness and a man's piety was being discussed, the Holy Prophet told his companions that no human on earth would be forgiven because of good deeds. It is only Allah's grace which ultimately delivers humans from the bondage of sin and grants them admission into heaven. This made them wonder, and one of them asked, O Prophet of God! Will you not be forgiven for your piety and good deeds? He said, No, not even me. I will be forgiven only by the grace of God. Everything belongs to him, nothing is ours. Whatever he has granted us, we use it and employ it to the best of our knowledge and abilities. Even a man with acts of piety, having spent all his life doing good deeds, will not be forgiven because of his actions. Those noble opportunities were given to him by God. His humility knew no bounds. When sitting among his followers, ordinarily clothed, eating the same food as they did, he did not occupy a very special place. Many a time, people were mistaken as to who was the holy founder of Islam. Abu Bakr, who later became the first caliph of Islam, was older than he and perhaps had a longer beard, I don't know, but something in him led some strangers to address him as the prophet of God. In a respectful attitude, he would then turn to the holy prophet and lead them to him. Once, Umar, who later became the second caliph of Islam, took his permission to perform Umrah, a lesser pilgrimage to Mecca than Hajj. The holy prophet of Islam turned to him and said, Yes, go ahead, perform the Umrah, and please do not forget me in your prayers. Such was the humility of the man on whose prayers every Muslim depended that he was asking one of his own servants to remember him in his prayers. All through his life he shared in every type of hardship faced by the Muslims in general. During the Battle of the Ditch he is known to have suffered hunger along with the others. When portions were allotted in digging the ditch he was no exception and did his part of labor. Once a companion saw him in a state that overwhelmed him, 
He remarked, On the day of the battle of Al-Ahzab, I saw the Holy Prophet carrying earth which was covering the whiteness of his abdomen. He was saying, Without you, O Lord, we would have no guidance, nor have given any charity, nor prayed, so please bless us with tranquility and make firm our feet when we meet our enemy. Indeed, people have oppressed us, but never shall we yield if they try to bring affliction upon us because of you. Jabir narrates that they were digging in the days of Al-Azab and came across a big rock. They told the Holy Prophet about it. When he got up, they saw a stone tied to his belly. He had not eaten anything for three days. It was an Arab custom to tie a stone like this when extremely oppressed with hunger. Perhaps this helped to alleviate its pangs. In another narration of the same incident, we find that companions of the Holy Prophet had a stone each tied to their bellies. But when the Holy Prophet lifted his shirt to show them, they saw two stones tied to his belly, indicating that he was suffering from hunger more than them. Jabir, on seeing this plight, could not bear it any longer. He took his permission to leave for the women's quarters, sought his wife, and asked her if she had anything to eat. She said that there was a goat and some flour. He told her to slaughter the goat because he'd seen the Holy Prophet in such an unbearable state. That was the man, Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, who always shared miseries with his devoted servants. There was no difference whatsoever. On the contrary, from many narrations on this subject, we can believe that he suffered the most. He was a dauntless, fearless person who never refrained from approaching danger head on. In his lifetime, he fought many defensive battles without ever waging a single offensive war. He was usually found in the most dangerous areas of the battle where the fighting would rage like mad. A narrator reports that when the Holy Prophet was sought during a battle, they would look for him in that area where combat was at its fiercest, and he would always be in the midst. Once in Medina, during the dead of the night, people heard some disturbing noises. In those days, attack was feared from all sides, so they saddled their horses and went on to investigate. They found the Holy Prophet already returning from that place, riding an unsaddled horse. He had gone in singly, in haste, without even preparing his ride. He assured them that it was nothing serious and they could all return to their homes. Once during a journey on a very hot summer's day, he was resting under the shade of a tree. A Bedouin who belonged to the idolaters saw his opportunity as the Holy Prophet was alone. He picked up the sword of Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, and woke him up, saying, tauntingly, Who would save you from my hands? He replied, Allah. This short answer so overwhelmed this man that his hands trembled and the sword fell from his hands. This time the Holy Prophet picked up the sword and asked the man, Now who would save you from me? The man, trembling with fear, could only reply, You are a gracious and merciful person. Please spare my life. The Holy Prophet said, Woe unto you, you did not even draw a lesson. It was God who saved me from you. This man was pardoned, of course. The Holy Prophet was a very big-hearted person. The Holy Prophet loved no place on earth greater than a mosque. This love in his heart was so intense that it is inconceivable for anyone else to have similar feelings. Once a Bedouin who was not a Muslim came to visit Medina and was lodged in the mosque. In those days, and even today in some parts of the